What I love about the societies of the Andes is that they developed completely independently from the rest of the world. Choices they made about their economy, about social relationships, about death, are just done in a different way, which is intriguing to understand. Welcome to this introduction to Peru, A Journey in Time, supported by Prom Peru. I'm Jago Cooper and I'm the head of the Americas here at the British Museum. Welcome to this tour. My name is Cecilia Pardo. I'm curator for this exhibition and we're very thankful to the Ministry of Culture and to the Art Museum of Lima in Peru. The Andes is one of the most extraordinary areas of cultural development in the world. But this is the first time in the British Museum's history that there's ever been a comprehensive exhibition to explore them. The title, Peru, A Journey in Time, isn't just a flippant title, it really means something. We take the last three and a half thousand years and we've selected six separate cultures. You go on a journey, chronologically, through time. But during the exhibition, we have these cross-temporal moments where we bring out the key themes and essence of Andean societies. We introduce the visitors into a section where objects talk about how the environments played an essential role. The societies that inhabited this part of the world managed to survive and thrive in one of the most remarkable, though challenging, environments in the whole planet. Because Peru has one of the driest deserts in the planet, but is also home to one of the richest oceans. So the objects, they all incorporate aspects of environment. So for example, we have textile with feathers created by a coastal society, incorporating feathers coming from the Amazon, or a lot of beads in a breastplate made up from turkeys coming from faraway regions. Through these objects, these societies managed to share and communicate their own system of beliefs where, where environments played a key role. So the landscapes of the Central Andes are connected by an incredible road network which go, dates back millennia and covers 40,000 kilometers. And it's this road network which takes us to our next stage, which is the site of Chavín de Juantar, which is located at one of the lowest passes over the high mountains of the Andes. Chavín is a, a ceremonial centre, that's how it's described by archaeologists. You get these objects that tell the story of people coming together for the first time with a sort of shared understanding of the landscape within which they live. If you look at these ear plates here, they're not only incredible for their size, but they also have these wonderful features combined together. You can see these faces with an eye, and you have this sort of feline head, and then these snakes coming down from them. These ear plates were found in a funerary context with a body, and so they were placed by the ears. They look almost impractical to actually have been worn in themselves, but their size talks to the status and importance of the individual with which they were buried. I love this vessel here, which has the spondylus shell and the strombus gigas, a conch shell, together in a ceramic vessel found up in the Andes. What it talks about is the incredible richness of that marine resource and the trade and exchange networks, which are taking objects hundreds of kilometers right up into the Andes. At the site of Chavín, you get these underground tunnels where offerings are made, and many of these strombus shells are actually found in those underground tunnels. So you get the, both the ceramic representation, but you also get the physical shell, which is talking about what's going on with them. They're being offered up to the gods into these underground water channels underneath this sacred site. So from Chavín in the highlands, the following section of the exhibition explores the way the Nazca and the Paracas lived in one of the driest deserts in the planet. They created massive lines, geometric shapes and naturalistic drawings in the Pampas, 500 kilometers of unfertile soil. Current research, though, has proved that these spaces were actually used by the Paracas and the Nazca. People here were using the space and performing rituals, probably in the search for water and fertility. 
the colors that they used in their pottery and textiles were very diverse and varied, and some of which are very much related to the drawings that we see in the geoglyphs. So for instance, here we have a fragment of a Nazca blanket with embroideries depicting hummingbirds, again birds related with that search of fertility. And also we have a whale which is a mythical being represented in Nazca iconography, which we can also see in not only one, but a few depictions in the geoglyphs. When a Paracas or Nazca person died, the community came together to ensure a safe journey into the ancestral realm, when the ancestors would still protect the living. Here we have a funerary blanket that belongs to the Art Museum of Lima collection. It depicts human beings bearing special accessories like diadems and nose rings and bearing severed heads which can be related with the ancestors. So we might think that the human beings depicted in these textiles are the ancestor into which the deceased is transformed through the journey into the afterlife. One of the biggest objects in the exhibition is this Nazca drum. It is very important, not only because it was probably used as a musical instrument in special ceremonies, but also because it depicts one of the main narratives of Nazca mythology. In the drum, we see five deities, probably ancestors, which combine elements from different animals, capturing severed heads, and also depictions on the way the Nazca thought about life, death, and rebirth. Eight hundred kilometers to the north of the Nazca, the Moche culture is flourishing in the same coastal desert. The Moche have a way of life that centers around these huge pyramid complexes. But one of the things I like most about the Moche is their traditions of ceramics. They're, I think, the best ceramicists in the ancient world. If you look at these portrait vessels, it really starts to bring the actual people alive. Many of these portrait vessels have been traced through time where the same individual grows older and you see that face changing as they get older through time. If you look at this particular vessel, you can see the person, they have these ear spools coming through the earrings, you have the hair bound behind the head, this textile woven cap or representation of a textile woven cap. And then here the stirrup vessel design which is so distinctive of moche pots. In reality, these wouldn't have been used as vessels for drinking or using drinking water. They're just used as a sort of iconographic representation of the person, their personality, their status within society. These extraordinary wooden sculptures depicting mythical beings, officers and prisoners were found in the Maccabi Islands just off the coast of northern Peru. When we were doing research in the stores at the British Museum in the early stages of this project, these objects appeared and although they had been briefly studied in the early 20th century, they had never been on display before. We think that actual sacrifices might have been taken place in the islands. According to this vessel, where we see Ayapayek, the main Moche deity, takes naked prisoners into the islands in these boats. We have this ceramic vessel in the exhibition that's a representation of an early Moche fisherman on a reed boat going out into the Pacific Ocean. And this sort of links with one of our collaborators for the exhibition, Victor Juan Chumo. He is a fisherman, third generation fisherman, in the village of Juan Chaco, right next to these ancient sites on the coast. He creates the reed boats today for his own fishing in everyday life, as many fishermen do along the coast. And it starts to talk about the technology, these continuities of practice. And what's really interesting is that another collaborator who works, an archaeologist who works in the region, found that the name Juan Chumo is found in the chronicles relating to the Chimu culture. I love these moments in the exhibition where the past and present are so closely and intimately interwoven and connected. You can totally see the practice and people of this part of the world totally connected through time.
About 1400, the Inca Empire emerged in the Central Andes. It was the biggest empire in the Americas. The origins of the Inca lies very much in the influence of past cultures. They learned on the past knowledge, specifically on the Wari. Here we have three Wari objects depicting a Wari officer wearing a tapestry. So the technology of the textile tapestry was introduced by previous cultures and the Inca developed it and took it to another level. And one of the main reasons why the Inca developed such a complex and vast empire in such a short span of time was because of the use and introduction of the quipu. The, the quipu was a set of knotted strings that was used for accountability, for accounting numbers of populations, of crops, to understand the population that they managed. The success of the Wari and Inca empires were really underpinned by incredible feats of human engineering and technological innovation. Whenever you visit the Andes, you can see this evidence in the landscape. Tens of thousands of square miles of agricultural terracing dating back hundreds of years. One of our collaborators is Manuel Choking, a fourth generation farmer at this high altitude who talks about the inherited knowledge of the agricultural understanding of these landscapes. This vessel here is a chakiyakta, which is like a, a representation of a digging stick. And then on top, you've got a vessel covered with these sort of maize cobs or maize kernel designs. It's talking about that relationship with agriculture. And the vessel itself is actually a pakcha, which would have been filled with liquid and then drunk out of, a ritual drink, probably fermented maize that have been used in a festival. These understandings of agriculture are hugely intergenerational. The ability of different communities to learn the specifics of their local climatic and environmental conditions and then adapting plants to meet them. So although the Inca Empire developed the largest empire in the Americas, they were very short-lived. They only lived and existed for 150 years because in 1532, Francisco Pizarro and his Spanish troops arrived in northern Peru, encountering the last Inca at Atahualpa, an event that marks the beginning of the Spanish colonial rule. One of the objects that marks the European encounter, the European arrival into the New World, is a manuscript that contains written documents alongside drawings, probably the first drawings done by Spanish, which evidence the way they looked and described the Incas and their ways of life. Something particularly interesting about this manuscript is that it describes and it depicts some tunics and tapestry that the Incas wore and that haven't been preserved across time. So we have to be careful when we study these written documents because sometimes they can be biased as they reflect the way one person thought about Inca society. Textiles have been a theme throughout the exhibition, weaving these ideas of different cultures using them in different ways through time. So when we were planning the exhibition, we started to think about the idea of a new textile commission, and we started talking to friends and colleagues throughout Peru. So we invited Nilda Cayañaupa to collaborate with us, and she has been working for more than 30 years with uh, weavers belonging to different Andean communities that have been using technologies in weaving and using raw materials and waste looms and technologies that date back to pre-Columbian times. So we had many discussions and showing her objects and the narrative of the exhibition and they came up with the idea of a textile that can reflect upon the main themes addressed in the exhibition. The idea of sort of using the Tawantinsuyu, the four parts of the Inca Empire, to create a textile with four quadrants, each inspired by one of the textiles in the exhibition. So behind us, you can see this textile in reality. It's got the Wari, the Inca, the colonial and the contemporary aspects 
all bonded together through a Chicana cross in the middle representing indigenous identity today. And what I really liked about it was that we created a video to accompany the work and you see people discussing their own histories as they're creating the object and their own reflections on those time periods of the past, which I think is a very powerful way of sort of embodying knowledge into the actual object. Totally, and I think that in the video we see the weavers spinning the yarn, dyeing the yarn and weaving it in waste looms and in other type of looms in the same manner that pre-Columbian societies did it hundreds and thousands of years ago. And so I hope you've enjoyed this introduction. We've tried to sort of give you only a tiny glimpse of a much bigger exhibition that explores some incredible cultures throughout the Central Andes. And we really hope you'll come and visit the exhibition for yourselves and see it in all its real splendor and color. Yeah. There are so many more objects and stories in the exhibition that I'm sure you will enjoy when you come.